Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful day in this webinar on drug discovery for infectious disease. Uh, this event is brought to you by NTU Institute of Advanced Studies and the Graduate Students Club from SBS and SPMS. My name is Shikhar from Graduate Student Club uh, in SBS, and I'm, I'll be your host for today's webinar. As part of the webinar housekeeping rules, uh, please turn off your webcams. We have muted the mics of all attendees to prevent any accidental disturbance during the presentation. Also, feel free to write your questions during or after the presentation in the chat box, and our speaker will be glad to take a look at them during the Q&A session later. Please note that we are recording this webinar and we'll send you the link when it's ready. And if you want to get endorsement for the attendance in this webinar, then you need to stay at least 75% of the duration. Moving on to our, uh, to our speaker for today, Dr. Thomas Keller, who is highly experienced researcher publishing more than 100 papers in medicinal chemistry and drug discovery. Dr. Keller has held several key positions. He was the head of chemistry at Novartis Institute for Tropical Diseases, Singapore, where he built up the medicinal chemistry department for drug discovery in dengue and TB. After that, he joined Experimental Therapeutic Center as a deputy director where he designed a wind porcupine inhibitor ETC-159, which is currently in phase one clinical trial. Now, he's holding the position of director at EDDC, where he's leading the research for new small molecular weight drug candidates. Recently, in April 2020, he took the most scientific role as senior advisor chemistry. I can say a lot about Dr. Keller, about his achievements, but time simply forbids. So without any further ado, please welcome Dr. Keller. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Let me, let me um, share my slides. I think, um, I hope everybody can see um, my first slide. I still have this. Yeah. Yes, okay. we can see that slide. Uh, yes, I, I mean, now I, I sh you should see my first slide, Infectious Disease for Drug Discovery. If you don't say anything, I assume you, everybody sees that. I will talk today about um, drug discovery um, um, in infectious diseases. And of course, this is especially topical because of, of SARS-CoV-2. Um, epidemic that we're currently having. Uh, but I, in the beginning, before I give an example of how we discovered the drug for malaria, I will just go through a few things that are very important to know uh, for inf infectious disease drug discovery. Yeah, and obviously I've received uh, six questions already. I will talk about them at the end. And so maybe some of these questions will be answered during the talk, but obviously feel free to, uh, to ask me questions afterwards. And it's usually a bit, a little bit simpler for me to answer questions if you type them in in the chat. Okay, I just want to um, I just wanted to discuss with you uh, the top global causes for death in 2016. And this is, this is put out um, basically every so often by the WHO. And what you can see on this slide is that actually infectious diseases do not play such a big role in the top 10 global causes of, of, um, um, of death. Uh, uh, in 2016, uh, there's lots of heart disease, lots of stroke, chronic obstructive diseases, and then lower respiratory infections. That, that is obviously always a very big item in these lists, um, because obviously in, in the third world, this is a big cause of death in children. And then at the, at the, at the bottom, you see there are real disease and tuberculosis. But obviously, uh, many of the, of the diseases on the list of these uh, top 10 are kind of Alzheimer, um, lung cancer, diabetes mellitus. These are first world diseases, right? And so infectious diseases really have disappeared a little bit from this top 10 list in the last few years. And uh, the difference, you know, when I, when I worked at Novartis Institute for Tropical Diseases, we always looked at the different disease burden um, 
in Africa, for example, which we always looked at kind of the prototypical developing countries and developed countries like Singapore or like Europe. And you could see the difference is really striking because in, in developing countries, the burden of infectious diseases are really, really high. While in Europe and the US and now also in Singapore, uh, the burden of infectious diseases is very small. And 85% of them are cancers, diabetes, and all kinds of these diseases that we uh, are suffering from in the in developed countries, right? So, so the, the spectrum of diseases is very different whether you're a developing country, uh, which is reasonably poor, or whether you're a first world country, which is a rich country. And so that, of course, uh, dictates a little bit, um, uh, you know, what the pharmaceutical industry is doing. And of course, you have to keep in mind that the pharmaceutical industry is obviously, uh, they are profit driven, right? And so there wasn't that much incentive for the pharmaceutical industry these days to work on infectious diseases, malaria, uh, tuberculosis, tuberculosis, schistosomiasis, leprosy, the kind of the, the prototypical um, neglect diseases, they're really only um, uh, problems in the developing world. And, and in, the, in, the, in countries like Singapore, you know, we're not really having a lot of TB, we don't have malaria, we don't have trypanosomes at all. Uh, we don't have worms, diseases, parasites, leprosy. That's not diseases that we're suffering from. And so uh, drug discovery is very expensive and it takes quite a long time uh, to, to show efficacy and safety for new treatments for these infectious diseases. So it's quite expensive. And so the, the driver for the, for the pharmaceutical industry is much bigger to find something for diabetes or cancer than to find something for tuberculosis or malaria. And of course, the same kind of happens uh, for SARS-CoV-2, right? I mean, maybe maybe this attitude will change a little bit now because obviously we have SARS-CoV-2 covering the whole world. But for example, dengue, influenza, cold, uh, these kind of diseases that we're still seeing in Singapore, they're pretty well treated with supportive care, right? They don't really last that long. And so drug, if you give drugs to patients like, like dengue, that have dengue infections or influenza, the drugs have to be very, very safe and, to, and you have to be able to give them to children. And so that's much, much higher hurdle for the safety of the drug. It's much more difficult to find these type of drugs. And of course, we have to keep in mind that for many infectious diseases, very good vaccines are available. And so the, um, the demand for, for drugs that you can take by the oral route are not really that large. And so I just want to show you, I just took from uh, two weeks ago, I, I, I took this graph, which shows the dengue cases in Singapore, right? Uh, we have a lot of dengue three um, this year, and it's it's more than in the past few years. And of course, you would say, well, you know, we really, really, really need a drug for dengue. And and when I was at the Novartis Institute of Tropical Disease, we discussed this off, often, and we worked very hard on a dengue drug. But whenever we talk to doctors and and um, uh, you know people in in public health, they always told us, well, you know. Um, for dengue, uh, the most important thing is the drugs are safe because obviously most people recover without much problems from dengue, even though it's a very painful disease. And so I just want to show you these two um, uh, graphs here, which are from a from a from a publications in 2002. And in these, uh, looking at two different biomarkers, you can see that actually the disease um, of dengue actually lasts only about two, two to four days, right? So the intervention, if you use an antiviral, we only, um, you can only interfere in the first three to four days. Afterwards, an antiviral will not really have an impact. And of course, that is very challenging because if you don't catch the patients very early, your antiviral drug will not have a big impact. And that may actually be also a problem for SARS-CoV-2, right? Currently, we still don't know what the, 
what the viral load is um, or SARS-CoV-2 and how long it lasts and how, how quickly you have to interfere with patients when you give them an antiviral drug. Uh, but, but that is, for example, in dengue, that is why, you know, the incentive to work on dengue in drug discovery is actually not that high because um, uh, even if you have, would have a drug, you could only treat patients, you would have to treat patients very, very early on. Okay, um, so when, you know, the reason why uh, infectious disease drug discovery is, uh, is very challenging is um, that if you can't uh, um, have drugs where we can make money, it's very, very difficult to persuade the pharmaceutical industry to invest money into these diseases. So for example, we see that for example, for chronic viral diseases like hepatitis C and HIV, there are lots of drugs available. But, but when we, in 2003, when I came to Singapore and I worked for the Novartis, well, you know, everybody said, well, we need a, um, a drug for SARS-CoV, right? For the first uh, SARS uh, virus that we dealt with in 2003. But after half a year, nobody was interested anymore in a SARS drug because obviously the, the virus disappeared and we never really saw it, saw it again. Now for SARS-CoV-2, this is a new challenge, right? We don't really know, um, uh, you know, how important the drug will be, but a lot of people are working on it currently. But again, um, you know, we're not sure if there is a difficult vaccine is coming out, whether uh, people really, really want a drug then. I mean, we'll see how this changes um, in the next half year or a couple of years. And so we always have to take in, keep in mind that drugs have to be potent and safe. And um, they have to be given, let me can, can to get my, my uh, pointer. And they have to be given by the oral route, right? So that needs, to, needs quite a bit of optimization if you want to, to have such a drug and that is convenient to the patient. And of course, drugs have to be tested in a lot of patients uh, before you can give it um, uh, you know, to the general population. And you, you can just see now in the vaccine trials, the vaccine from AstraZeneca just two days ago had to be stopped because there was a side effect that they didn't know what is happening. And so clinical phase three clinical trials are really, really important for any drug or vaccine. And so the reason why behavioral changes, mask, social distancing, contact tracing is very, very important in the short term, right? Because we don't have vaccines, we don't have drugs. In the medium term, we may have vaccines because you can make them available a little bit quicker. And all drug may, may come around in maybe five years or something like that, right? It takes that long to get them. And, <clears throat> you know, if SARS-CoV-2 sticks around, as a lot of people are predicting, then of course we need a drug. But these drugs will only come after a few years. Okay, uh, on this slide, I just want to show you the, the normal drug discovery uh, process that we're using, right? We, we usually uh, try to identify a target that we, can, that we can interfere with for a certain disease. We develop an assay. We try to find a chemical starting point. Uh, we do then hit to lead. This is kind of finding whether the starting point is suitable for drug discovery. Then we optimize the drug and then the drug goes into development. And of course, first it has to be synthesized in large scale, it has to be tested for toxicology. And then after that, which takes about one or two years, it can be tested in clinical trials. And the clinical trials, depending how quickly they go, again, uh, take about two to three years. And so that's how the, how the time really adds up. And so for a normal drug for cancer or diabetes, it usually takes about six, seven years uh, from the start to come to the market. And if you really, really speed up, maybe it can be done in, in five years if, if we get the approval from the authorities, right? So that's the reason why there's a lot of 
time spent in, in finding a, a new oral drug. And I'll try to demonstrate to you now um, how this really um, works uh, by looking at the malaria drug that we did um, at the Novartis Institute for Tropical Diseases. And, and uh, in the next few slides, um, uh, I, will, I will show you how we developed, how we found the chemical starting point and how we optimized it, right? There's going to be quite a little bit of chemistry for you to get used to. But first, obviously, we have to talk about malaria. And malaria is obviously not a disease that we're suffering from in Singapore. But if you go to Indonesia, if you go to, to some other Asian countries um, like, like uh, Cambodia, um, Myanmar, Thailand, there's a lot of, of uh, malaria around. And of course, the most lethal strain is called Plasmodium falciparum. This mostly occurs in Africa. In Asia, we have other strains, Plasmodium vivax, uh, malaria, and ovale. But I think in, in Thailand, for example, there's also Plasmodium falciparum. Um, and, and these kind of more, more benign strains like Plasmodium virax, they reproduce in the liver and they can lead to continuous outbreaks. So it's, it's really, really difficult to deal with the so-called chronic malaria. And in 2018, there were 220 million cases of malaria worldwide and 67% um, uh, of all malaria deaths in 2018 were in children. And this is especially in Africa. Uh, I think um, it's really, really um, one of the tragedies of malaria that mostly children die from this, um, from this disease. And of course, this also mandates that the drugs for malaria are really, really safe. Okay, on this slide, I just want to, you know, malaria has been around for a very long time. And um, uh, we have quite a lot of drugs for malaria. But the problem is that most of these drugs have become, uh, uh, the parasite, the malaria parasite has become resistant to these drugs. So for example, already in 1632, people uh, figured out that quinine was, was a natural product. It's very good for treating malaria. But already in 1910, um, you know, most, um, in most countries, uh, resistance to quinine came up. And then there was chloroquine, uh, which again, um, in 1957 already, we had a lot of resistance to this drug. And actually currently, if you go to Africa, chloroquine is not really a useful drug because basically all malaria parasite are resistant to this to chloroquine. Then, you know, other compounds came in, croquanil, and you can see this wasn't a very good drug because even one year after introduction, um, uh, we saw uh, really strong resistance to the, uh, to the drug by the parasites. The same for the sulfadoxine pyrimethamine uh, combination. This um, actually was a problem because uh, resistance already occurred in clinical trials. Mefloquine, a little bit better for, for about five years. The drug was quite effective, but um, currently there's lots of resistance. And so today, the only drug that is really um, effective in treating patients um, in the developing world is a drug called artemisinin. And artemisinin is a very interesting drug because it's, it's a drug that comes uh, from a herbal source, from a from a, um, that's extracted from a, a, a plant called Artemisia annua, a sweet, wood, sweet wormwood, and this was actually discovered in China. This is a, a, a plant that occurs very much in China. And um, this plant was, was already talked about in 1596 by Chinese herbalists. And in 1972, Chinese scientists then started to isolate the natural product. And the natural product down here is shown, this is artemisinin. And you can see that's very, if you have taken some chemistry, this is a very complicated drug, right? It has a peroxide here. And one of the biggest problems for this drug is um, that uh, it's so insoluble, both in oil and water, that it's really, really difficult to administer and it's very rapidly metabolized. 
And so the Chinese scientists, um, um, after the isolation, they made, they made some chemistry, took some chemistry, and came up with artemether and artesanate. And these two compounds are much more stable, and they are much more soluble. And so these are the two drugs that are currently being used in, in the combination treatments that, that are used in Thailand, Myanmar, in Africa, all over the place. And so that, that is kind of the, the a natural product um, and that is, that is that's isolated from, from, from a plant and then it's sterilized uh, by, by chemistry to, to get a little bit more stable compounds. And the problem with, with artesanate um, or, or artesamine is that um, slowly in the last few years um, there has been uh, more and more resistance observed for these type of drugs. And while it's not clear what's actually happening in the parasite with this compound, you know, how to become resistant to that, it's, it's very clear that you need more and more drug to treat the patients. And, and this is kind of a uh, um, illustration of that. And of course, because that is basically one of the few drugs that is still um, quite active uh, and can and is quite cheap and can, and, and um, even patients in developed countries can be treated. This was quite worrying in 2009 and 2010 uh, when the WHO, uh, you know, started kind of thinking about whether we could uh, find new malaria drugs. And of course that um, was the task that the Novartis Institute for Tropical Diseases took up and we collaborated with, a, with an organization uh, that is very close to the WHO, which is called Medicines for Malaria Ventures. And, and that's a, a not-for-profit organization. And so we collaborated from the Novartis with them and, and we worked out a so-called target product profile, right? Whenever we make a drug from the beginning, you have to know what uh, the chemists and biologists have to develop, right? So it was clear that we needed a new mode of action. We didn't want it to be similar to our chemistry. And, and we definitely didn't want it to be similar to the old drugs that are already resistant. Um, it should, um, it was desirable that the drug would clear a parasite rapidly from the patient. That means it needs to kill the parasite very rapidly. It should be an oral drug, obviously, that's, that's very important uh, uh, for patients. And it should have pharmacokinetic properties that allow what's the day dosing. Pharmacokinetics is how the drug is treated, treated by the body and how quickly it's eliminated from the body. So we needed to optimize the compound that stayed in the patient for at least um, a day. So it could be taken uh, uh, once a day. I mean, this is different from, for example, when you take aspirin, which you have to take every three hours, right? Otherwise, otherwise you lose efficacy. We wanted to have it, uh, it's possible that you can give it once a day. And of course, because it, it was to be used in the, in the third world, uh, it should be cheap to produce. And, and, but they said, okay, novelty is more important than costs. We want, they wanted to reduce the pill burden for patients because combination treatments are, of course, very important in malaria treatment. And, and you know, as I, uh, combination treatments, infectious diseases, that's basically standard, right? You never just take one drug, but you always try to combine it two or three drugs. Um, so resistance is, uh, appears slower. Okay, and of course, whenever you work on, on finding a new drug, you always have to ask yourself, are we going to do um, a target-based approach? Are we going to isolate the protein that we want to target our drug to? And, and are we going to do structural design? Are we going to, are we going to do crystal structures? Um, are we going to do virtual screening? Can we do fragment screening, computer aid design, whatever? This is only possible if you have a clear protein to work on. There's another approach which is more kind of the old-fashioned approach 
If you don't have a target, of course, especially in infectious diseases, you can just try to kill the parasite, right? Even not knowing what the mechanism of a drug is, you just take the parasites and you do a high throughput screening and you look for drugs that kill the parasite. And that is the, the, the old fashioned approach. But for infectious diseases, this is often what is chosen. And this is what was chosen by, by medicines for malaria ventro, by Novartis, um, to do the drug discovery. So we had a cell based approach. We had a malaria parasite based approach. Um, and so the screening that, we, that I will be talking about was done um, with the parasite in high throughput. And uh, to do this project, uh, there were three institutes were involved in this. The Novartis Institute for Tropical Diseases here in Singapore. We did the chemistry, the pharmacokinetics and the project management. The Swiss Tropical Institute in Basel did the parasite biology and animal models. So they, they are experts in malaria. And so they had, uh, they had uh, the, um, the parasites available. They had animals, a uh, mouse model for the, for the malaria parasites. So that was something that we, we couldn't do here in Singapore. And then we worked together with the Novartis Institute for Job, uh, not Novartis uh, in San Diego. And they are excellent in screening and, and high throughput evaluation of parasite biology. So basically, Novartis in San Diego they did all the imaging and screening in high throughput. This is something that we didn't have in Singapore at that time because uh, to set this up, it would be very expensive. So each institute had a specific task to do. And what we wanted to do is, you know, I showed you the, uh, this is an even abbreviated way of showing um, uh, the flow chart of what we're doing in drug discovery. And, you know, what we want to discuss, I told you that we would do parasite killing, right? That was our major readout. But of course, we wanted to annotate the biology much better. We wanted to know which stage of action we are killing in the malaria parasite, because the malaria parasite goes through several stages of, of, of action inside the human body. We wanted to, as I said, we wanted to have a very speedy drug. We want to see whether we could kill the liver stage. Uh, we want to have uh, gametocidal activity. That's a, a, um, the, the parasite stage that is very, very important for disease. And of course, we want to know what is the most mode of action of our compound. Even though we did a black box screening, we wanted later to very quickly figure out what the mode of action of our parasite of our drug was. <clears throat> and so what we decided, and this was actually one of the questions that was asked, you know, when you look for a chemical starting point for drug discovery, you usually do screening. You take collections of compounds and you screen them in high throughput. And in this case, this was screened through a parasite killing assay, right, in San Diego. So we had 12,000 natural products, we screened them, uh, we confirmed the hit, we did a high content analysis just to understand at which stage our compound was working. Um, we screened it then on 15 strains of drug-resistant falciparum uh, um, parasites, just to make sure that our drug that we found was also active on the on the multi drug resistance uh, parasites. Then, of course, to make sure that our compound was really um, non toxic, we tested in a six cell uh, a toxicity panel and we looked for a safety index of greater than 12, 20 fold. And then we did preliminary pharmacokinetics just to understand how long the compound stayed in the body of the mouse or of a human. And of course, when we do drug discovery, we, we don't really have access to humans, right? We, we have to do everything in, in rodent animal models just to kind of understand how the drugs are treated by, a meta by a metabolizing um, um, mouse, for example. And so I just want to give you a little bit an example of how this works, right? I, sh I showed you on the last slide 
we screened 12,000 natural products. And so these were seven of the compounds that we, that we got out of the screening. And so one of the most important things that you will want to look at is does your, your compound stay in the mouse for a while or is it rapidly eliminated? You have to keep in mind that our body or especially a mouse, the body of a mouse, they really specialized in getting rid of foreign compounds very quickly, right? So it always needs quite a bit of work to make sure the compound stays in the, in the body of the mouse for quite a while. And so we did something um, uh, that is called a, a very quick experiment in the mouse to see how long the compound stayed. And, and you could see there was actually only one which stayed for quite a while, while the others, the others were, were metabolized very quickly. And so if you look at the seven compounds that I have here, you can see all of them are exceedingly potent, right? This one was 41 nanomolar um, IC50. So this is the 50%, uh, the, the concentration of which 50% of the parasite dies. This was 41 nanomolar, very, very potent. This one was 20, this one was 143, 85, 33. But from, from this kind of looking quickly at the pharmacokinetics, it was very clear that this was, was uh, looked like the best compound um, overall. It was at a, an IC50 of 85 nanomolar and it stayed for quite a while in the body. So this looked like a very, very interesting compound. And so what we did, we started to look at what are the properties of the compound, right? This is not often talked about um, when you do drug, when, when you talk about drugs um, in the newspaper or when you talk about drugs at university. Very important for biologists and chemists is what are the, what are the properties of a compound? How quickly is it absorbed? Uh, can it penetrate to the cell membrane? And these are two assays which can show us whether our compound is actually good and when it's green, that means it's good. Of course, we will always look at the solubility of the compound because even though that's not very sexy, it's very, very important if you want to develop a drug. Is it, is it soluble? We want the compound, as I told you, we do not want to be quickly metabolized. So we look at liver microsomes to see how quickly our compound is metabolized. And of course, what we also don't want is um, have uh, interactions of compound in the liver. And so we look at the inhibition of liver enzymes. And that's very important that this is, is um, does it give us trouble. And of course, we always look at the IC50 of our compounds. Is it potent to killing the parasite? And in the, mid, in the middle, you see a pentagram which just shows the chemist a very quick view of the, of the profile of the compound. And ideally, all the points will be inside the green, the green space, right? That would be a very good drug. And you can see everything looks great, except the water solubility is not quite as good as we would like. But otherwise, this looked great. And of course, as I told you, <coughs> we will always look at the, at the pharmacokinetics. We inject the compound into the mouse, and this is the pink line, and we see how long it takes for the compound to be eliminated. And we give the compound in the, in the, by the oral route uh, to the mouse, and we see how long the compound stays in the mouse. And so uh, this kind of compound that I showed you in the last slide, uh, this is the pharmacokinetics. This looks already from screening, looked very attractive, right? It's already what we call a bioavailability of 59%. So if you take this, if you gave the mouse this compound by the oral route, 59% of the compound um, entered the mouse and could then kill the parasite. We'll, we'll look at that. Um, quite a bit later uh, when, I, when I talk about the, the profile of the compound in the mouse. And of course, when you work on a drug, you always will have to look at, uh, at the chemistry, right? How easy is the chemistry? And, you know, in this case, it was two steps. But one of the problems that, that we had is that we have two color centers. 
one chiral center is here and the other, the other chiral center is here. And if you remember back to your second year chemistry, you know that if you have two chiral centers, that would be four diastereomers, right? And so uh, there are four possible isomers of these compounds that we, gonna, that we have to look at. We need a quick crystal structure just to make sure that our assignment of the structure was fine. You can see this here. And, and so you can see the chemistry look fine. Um, but as I said, we got opposite diastereomers, and so we had to figure out, um, you know, what is the activity of these diastereomers um, uh, on the parasite, right? That's something that, that, as a chemist, you will have to ask yourself very quickly. But uh, first, I just want to kind of, you know, what we, what we communi communicated to the Medicines for Malaria Venture, our WHO um, collaborators, you know, after doing the profiling, we said, you know, it looks like an excellent compound. That, that is very nice. We have a clear structure activity profile. I'll show this on the next slide. The compound has very good physical properties, solubility, permeability, metabolism. That looks great. Um, we, uh, the synthesis is short. However, you know, that to get the pure enantiomers, uh, we'll have to do some work for that. And so um, the synthesis is okay, but as I said, we have diastermers and we're gonna have to really see whether we can, whether we can produce them all separately. And so obviously everything was fine. And so we said, okay, this is a good chemical starting point for what we call a lead optimization. And the lead optimization is probably something that, that you're not familiar with, or maybe you've heard it um, during your studies. Lead optimization means that during that time, you have to optimize all the parameters that are important for safety, activity, pharmacokinetics, everything needs to be optimized so we can eventually go to a, to a human clinical trial so you can treat a human and usually a lead optimization takes about 15 months on average. And so this is where the chemists tailor the compound to be kind of, to have an optimal profile. And of course the biologists, pharmacologists, they, they work with the compound, see how it works in cells, see what the mode of action is, um, and how it works in animals and so on, as I will, as I will show you. And this is kind of a way to just kind of illustrate to you um, what happens in the lead optimization. Um, you know, it's a little bit like a Rubik's Cube. You have in the beginning, you have all kinds of things that you need to optimize. And eventually, um, obviously, um, everything should, should line up to a compound that has good ATME, good safety, good efficacy. And ATME stands for absorption, distribution, metabolism, and elimination. And there are lots of different parameters that you have to optimize them. I don't want to go into, into details here, but often we synthesize 500 to 1,000 compounds and in the end, two or, to get in the end, two or three candidates that have the optimal profile, right? That's, that's what usually happens in a lead optimization. And this has to be done for every disease, whether you work on diabetes, whether you work on SARS-CoV-2, whether you work on malaria, right? And on the next slide, um, you can see how this is done. There's two ways you can do this. Either you can do, you can do it the modern way, you can, you can get crystal structure, you can do computational design, you can, do, you can use AI for optimizing the compound, or you can do it the old fashioned way, you just synthesize compounds and you look at the biological activity and then design uh, the next compound, right? So you can also use um, machine learning for this, but it doesn't work that well currently. So this is what we call structure activity re relationship based optimization. And this is computer aided drug design. Uh, unfortunately, we could not do this for malaria because we didn't have a crystal structure for our compound. So this was a very kind of old fashioned optimization. And the only thing we had was structure of the compound. 
and the biological activity. And, and yeah, this, is, this kind of illustrates that we, didn't, we couldn't do computer-aided design in this optimization. And so here we, um, we have what I'm calling structure activity relationship. Um, you can see here, I don't know, it's hidden by, by this thing, that, um, you know, we synthesize compounds and we change the structure with the methyl, a seven-membered ring, uh, eight-membered ring, seven-membered ring without the methyl, seven-membered ring with the methyl, six-membered ring, six-membered ring with two methyls, six-membered ring with one methyl. And you can see that depending on the structure, the activity changes a lot. So for example, the eight-membered ring is actually not very good. This is totally inactive, right? While the seven-membered ring, you have 86 nanomole, a very good um, activity. If you add uh, a methyl, this doesn't really change a lot on the seven-membered ring. On the six-membered ring, you are a little bit less potent. Uh, but if you add a methyl on the six-membered ring, you get the 27 nanomole or so. This was excellent, right? This is what we call structure activity. Changing structure, looking at the activity. And chemists are trained to then work and, and build hypotheses based on this data to, um, uh, to then design the next compound. And you will see how this kind of is done on one of the, on some of the next slides. And let me see. The next slide is not coming. I seem to be stuck on this slide here. <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah, okay. This is the next slide. So on this slide, I want to um, show you, you know, how we look at the molecule. I showed you this, this molecule on the, on, the, on the last slide, and this was 27 nanomolar. And this was still a racemate. I mean, this was a mixture of two diastermers. And you can see on the right side, as I told you, we always look at the metabolic stability. And as an example, I've also looked at the cytochrome P450 liver enzyme inhibition. This is, as I said, this is very, very important for toxicity. And of course, we look at many other parameters, but just not to confuse you, I'm only using these two parameters to, to show you what happens when you start working with the compound, right? These are, these are properties that have to be optimized. And, and so what we did, I told you, this is a mixture of two diastermers. We separated the diastermers. And this was done by our colleagues in Basel using chromatography. And you can see, lo and behold, when we separate the, the diastermers, we get one diastermer, which, which is totally inactive, and one diastermer, which is, which is 9.2 nanomolar. So that's a very, very good, good drug candidate. Well, this one obviously is totally inactive. And so just keep in mind, this, this can often be seen, this difference in diastermer, um, because keep in mind, they interact with proteins and proteins are chiral. So when compounds interact with chiral compounds, interact with chiral proteins, we often see what we call chiral discrimination. And so that's not very rare to see this, even though it may stun you that there's such a huge difference between the compounds, because obviously they have exactly the same structure except for the diastermeric uh, mixtures, right? So uh, uh, the chiral centers in the compounds. <coughs> When we now start to look at the metabolic stability and uh, the cytochrome P450 inhibition, we see that we were quite unlucky because the inactive compound is a fantastic drug if it would be active, right? It's not metabolized, it's totally inactive on cytochrome P450. But unfortunately, this compound is not interesting because it's not, um, it cannot kill a parasite. <clears throat> On this compound, this is 9.2, very, very interesting drug, but unfortunately the metabolic stability is very bad and it has some cytochrome P450 inhibition, especially one of the isomers here, 2C9, is, is inhibited with 1.5 micromolar, which is a bit worrying uh, for liver toxicity. 
So we have to do some work on that. And, and on the next slide, I will first show you, because here at your DC, um, two diastermers. We, of course, also synthesized all the other diastermers. You can see, I, I told you, since you have two power centers, you will have four diastermers. You have the one R3S, one S3R, one S3S, and one R3R. And you can see that, that all of them have very different um, biological activity. And one is totally inactive. This one is not that great. This one is pretty inactive as well. While, while this one uh, is really, really potent drug. So, so the trans um, uh, one R3S, that was the compound that we were mostly interested in. And of course, I showed you that this compound is very highly metabolized. So we have to find a solution for that, right? That's why it takes you quite a while to optimize this compound. You constantly have this type of problems and you have to find scientific solutions to them. So we looked at this molecule, we read the literature, we did metabolic identification studies, and uh, we came to the conclusion that they are very likely were, uh, these compounds were very likely to be metabolized at these two positions. There was also a suspicion that maybe there was a little bit of, of metabolism here, but we ignored that. We concentrated on these two compounds, on these two positions of the compound, and we started to synthesize compounds to block these two positions. And a, a technique that we often use to block metabo metabolic uh, weak points is to introduce a fluorine because fluorines are quite small and they are a little bit bigger than hydrogen, but they behave in quite a similar way. And so when we introduce this fluorine here, you can see that uh, actually, luckily, the, the IS-50 didn't change a lot, but, you know, compared to the one without the fluorine, you can see we started to get um, a little bit better metabolic stability uh, compared to this compound, right? Uh, the, we had the medium in the human. And so that was the signal to us that our hypothesis would be correct, but we probably needed to introduce another fluorine in this position because we said these two positions were the problems, right? So our next step was introducing two fluorines. And so I have to stress this was purely hypothesis uh, based um, medicinal chemistry, right? We, we then of course made the, the, the difluoro and the fluorochloro. And you can see that by blocking these two metabolic sites, we have absolutely total stability now. We have achieved what we wanted, right? Compared to the, to the original compound that the two hydrogens here, this is much, much more stable. And, and also fluorochloro, this is exactly uh, very similar. Also metabolic clearance has been totally blocked. And you can see even the cytochrome P450 inhibition is a little bit better. I mean, we still have one that is a bit below 10 and 10 is what we wanted. But when we talk to our colleagues at um, Medicines for Malaria Venture and our clinicians at Novartis, they said, well, you know, 7.3 is probably not such a great problem. So this was basically, um, these were basically two compounds which we could take very seriously in terms of um, uh, drug candidates. And you can see, of course, that they both are extremely potent uh, killers of the parasite. And so, um, I will give you now an overview of, of what I told you, the pharmacokinetics. And the pharmacokinetics, there are several parameters that we're going to look at. One of them is bioavailability. And as I told you, bioavailability just tells you how much of the drug is absorbed um, when you give it to a human by the oral route, right? And you could already see that, that the, the, the one with the two hydrogens compared with the one with the two fluorines and the one with the fluorochloro, there's a huge difference, right? The fluorochloro is by far the best, um, the best bioavailability. And when we look at the AUC, I will explain to you what this means on the next slide. You can also see that the fluorochloro um, is by far the best compound, right? So, so even though in terms of metabolic stability, they looked kind of the same in terms of the oral pharmacokinetic profile, 
is Kanban, it's by far the best. And on the next slide, this, is, this is shows you graphically the pharmacokinetics. And what I told you, the, the so-called AUC, this is the area under the curve. And so this is the, the curve for 609. So this number that I showed you on the, on the last slide, this 138.6, this just tells you what the area under the curve is for this nanogram per mil, right? This is, this is just the way that we, we describe the activity, the pharmacokinetics of a compound. And of course, this is much more visual than what I showed you on the next slide, right? The, the compounds, uh, the blue compound here is absorbed very quickly, but then it's eliminated very quickly, while the two other ones are staying in the body for much longer. And of course, this is a mouse, right? This is a oral, a PO means oral administration of the drug in the mouse. And so this um, uh, shows us that at NITD 609, this was the best compound. It stayed the longest in the mouse and promised to be a very good drug um, for that. And so this is then when we go into the, what we call the efficacy model. And we had two efficacy models. One was one day treatment and the other one was three, three day treatments. So you give, you treat the mouse every day with your drug and you see whether, you know, how the mouse fares. This is the three day model. What we are using is a, mal a malaria parasite that's specific for the mouse. It's called Plasmodium burgae. Uh, disinfects the mouse and actually the mice die from this parasite if you don't interfere with it with a drug. And so here, this is a little bit a difficult slide for you to see, but I just will go through it um, one by one. We have, we give the, uh, four different drugs to the, com to the mouse. We give an artemisinin analog, we give chloroquine, which I told you is a very good drug against malaria, but unfortunately in Africa, there's lots of resistance to it. We use mefloquine, which is also a very good drug, but again, resistance is a problem in many countries. And then this is our new compounds that we optimize now. And then the first thing that we look at is what is the, the killing of the parasite? How much of the parasite is killed? And you can see that um, all of these drugs, um, uh, this is the one times uh, administration and this is the three times administration. So you can see that three times administration kills much more parasites than one times administration. And you can see that our new drug is far superior to the other ones uh, because it gives 99%, 99.9% um, killing of the parasite. And then a much more stringent way to look at this at these compounds is to look at whether the mouse survives and how long it survives. And you can see that that actually, even with that designate, the mouse actually, um, the, all the mice die after 7.3 uh, days. While if you give them three times 30 milligram, they survive for 11 days. And the great breakthrough was that our new drugs that we, that we optimized, if you gave it three times, 30 milligrams on three consecutive days, all the mice survived. So this, this drug uh, killed all the parasite and all the mice survived. So that's exactly the, um, the profile that we want to find in doing, uh, for, the, for a new drug candidate, right? And so uh, this was basically the journey that I wanted to show you, right? We started with this compound, which came from high throughput screening. And then we optimized all the parameters that I showed you. And of course, there were more parameters that were optimized. In the end, we came up with this compound. And this compound is a very, very attractive antimalarial compound. And so um, that's kind of, you know, if you want to make a drug for SARS-CoV-2, you have to go through similar steps um, and it will take um, a year to 18 months um, to optimize the compound to get a good drug to kill the SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, virus. And so if you're interested um, in the science uh, more in detail, you can look at these two, these two papers. 
And of course, now I'm, I'm finished with my presentation. I've almost had an hour now. And of course, we can now go to the, through the, the questions that you already sent to me. And um, I will go through the six one that I have here. Um, and then if you want to ask other questions, please feel free and, and type them into the chat um, app so I can look at them afterwards. So the first question was, what are the challenges in drug development and how industry, academia and government play roles to support each other to meet the challenges? Um, I mean, this is a little bit um, an, an, an interesting question because the drug discovery is a very, very uh, expensive undertaking. And so it's mostly done by the industry, by pharmaceutical companies and by by biotech companies, right? There's not that big a role that academia and uh, can play. Government, of course, play a role in in that um, in in admitting the, the compounds for treatments, right? There, we always deal with um, with the government agencies when you when you present your clinical trial result, and the, and uh, and the government agency have to give the clear if a, if a compound is admitted for treatment, for example, for malaria. So it's mostly the industry and the biotech industry that, that does drug discovery. And of course, we at ASTAR, we are doing also some drug discovery, but we never have the same amount of money as, for example, Anavartis has. Um, then the second month, in pandemic times, or when tackling issues with infectious diseases, how good is the capacity and current infrastructure to allow development of fast, reliable cure for, for public use um, and curb the disease spread in or enhancing treatments? I mean, this is, of course, uh, a very good question, right? I mean, if we get a new disease like, like SARS-CoV-2, um, Drug discovery in the beginning is very difficult because we don't know anything about the disease. We first need to isolate the virus. We need to look at the proteins. We need to find the weak points of the, of the, of the virus. And we, we need to also see kind of, you know, what's the impact of the virus on the people. I mean, you can see now that in the beginning, you know, we had lots of deaths from SARS-CoV-2. But now it looks like we have the, the, the treatment in the hospitals, even though we don't have any excellent drugs, the treatments of the disease is much more, has much more, is much more sophisticated and much less people die these days. Um, I mean, in Singapore, we haven't had a death for several weeks, right? And in Europe, exactly the same. Um, so um, to react quickly, is sometimes a little bit difficult because um, you know, SARS in 2003 exactly showed if we invest a lot uh, to look at the proteins and, and started uh, drug discovery, but after half a year, nobody was interested anymore, right? So it's always a little bit difficult to find the, um, the right starting point. So for, for malaria and TV and things like that, these are diseases who have been around for hundreds of years, right? That's a no-brainer. But again, I told you, these are neglected diseases because the pharmaceutical industry does not really see a big incentive to work in these areas. Third question, what can scientists around the world, be it in industry, academia, or government agency, do better to improve response to pandemic um, also any kinds of in infectious diseases. I think, you know, now that, that, we, that we have seen that coronaviruses could be a problem that will, will kind of occupy us also in the future, right? We had SARS, we had MERS, we had SARS-CoV-2, and there's, there's probably other um, coronaviruses that, that are some, somewhere in, in bats somewhere around the world and that could emerge. So what you can do is you can, you can improve your infrastructure. You can be much better prepared uh, to quickly analyze the virus, uh, sequence the, the RNA 
um, you know, be prepared with your crystallography and you have everything ready, but it still will take quite a long time to get the drug out. I hope I, I, I demonstrated this to you. It's not possible to get a, a totally new drug in a couple of years. That, that is not possible even, you know, if, if some people in the AI field claim that is, that is possible. But the most problem or the most time that, that it takes is um, testing the safety of the, of the compounds. And you can see that now with the, with the vaccines, right? Uh, the phase three clinical trials are really, really important because you see um, um, adverse events. And of course, you do not want to take a drug that you know has an adverse event, right? So, so these type of safety studies uh, and patients are really, really important. And that's why it takes quite a while for, for vaccines and for drugs to come to the market. Uh, the, the fourth question, has the current pandemic affected the timelines of drug testing? Uh, made it shorter, made authorities revive the timelines for testing of drugs. I think I have to be honest for, for drugs, it hasn't really changed. For vaccines, it seems like, um, you know, we are much quicker than we were in the past. Uh, but we'll see, you know, we'll see when the first uh, vaccine will really come to the market, whether that's, that's really will, will come in, in early 2021 or whether it takes longer. And that all depends on the safety studies, right? I think a, a lot of vaccines show nice, um, uh, responses in animals or in, in cell tests. But of course, we have to make sure these vaccines are safe and that takes quite a while to test. But I have to say for drugs, so far I have not seen a lot of responses in terms of making drug discovery quicker. Um, uh, I mean, there's lots of people think about how can we do uh, more informed drug discovery. And of course, we all talk about uh, uh, machine learning, how this can impact drug discovery. But currently, it is not clear um, how the impact will be. I mean, I hope the next uh, question I answered, what was your inspiration reference compound for discovery of cypargamine? I mean, um, you know, when you start the drug discovery, you always need a chemical starting point. This cannot be just dreamed up by, by a chemist. That's why we do high throughput screening. And that's then the chemical starting point. And then comes the optimization of the compounds. And unfortunately, <clears throat> even today, it's not possible to do de novo design. Um, even with artificial intelligence, we're not capable to, to do away with high throughput screening. Maybe in five, 10 years, this will be possible, but we'll see uh, you know, whether this will, will happen. Then the sixth uh, question is, how long does it take to discover a cure and develop a medication for it? Um, I think, I hope I demonstrated to you that, that um, for malaria, I think it took us maybe the optimization, the whole thing probably took about one and a half years. And um, of course, in this case, you can, you can talk of a cure, right? Uh, for infectious diseases, you can't find cures. But keep in mind that for cancer and for diabetes and for metabolic diseases, it's very, very difficult to find cures. Usually you find treatments that, that makes the uh, the daily life of a patient improves the daily life of a patient. Curing these chronic diseases is very, very difficult. But for infectious diseases, clearly cure is possible. So that's basically my question, uh, my answers to the questions. I'll be happy to, to answer any, any question that, that people have uh, in terms of um, in terms of my my presentation or whatever. I, I will stop sharing now. And so you see my face. Oh, we have 26 chats. 20, I assume these are questions now. 
you can see, you can see I'm at home here. I'm working from home. So so thank you, Dr. Yes. Keller, for such an inspiring session, uh, enlightening us on how adventurous the journey for drug discovery can be. So now we can move on to our Q&A session where like our participants have asked some questions in the chat box itself. Uh, there are quite a few actually, so we can uh, maybe yeah, answer I them. Mean, I think the first one is, can deep learning apply to drug discovery? I mean, we are, we're trying very hard um, um, <clears throat> to apply deep learning in drug discovery and um, this will happen in the future but um, what is clear and I think what everybody agrees with these days is um, deep learning um, will be um, helping in drug discovery. It will never displace the scientists right and, and so it's very important that we talk about deep learning. I mean I think for the question because the deep learning that's the, that's the right question. We shouldn't talk about AI because AI, that's that's what that's what Amazon does. You find which books you like. I think um, we have been using machine learning and drug discovery for a long time, and it has never been uh, very helpful. But deep learning looks like it's much more much more applicable, and and we are trying to do that. But of course, its impact on science is still a little bit uh, at the beginning, and so. Um, you will see a lot of progress in the next few years, but it's challenging. How do you screen 12,000 compounds? Actually, that's, that is not, no, you do, this is physical screening. This is in, in 384 well plates. Um, and actually, we sometimes screen a million compounds. In the, in the pharmaceutical industry, you sometimes screen 1 million, 1 million and a, and a half compounds. And this can be done by uh, by either screening mixtures or screening compounds alone in in a high throughput format. This is all chromatized, and and even the, uh, the dispensing of the compound is robotic. So so uh, this this has been developed in the last twenty years. And it's really sophisticated, and the readouts are very sophisticated. So that. That is, has nothing to do with artificial intelligence. That's that's basically uh, robotics, um, screening a lot of compounds against either parasites or against proteins. Then the next one is what was the target protein structure the same between the mouse and the human, or were different compounds synthesized? I think for malaria, this um, because we worked on the full parasite, right? At the beginning, when we did the chemistry, we didn't know the protein. I mean, now, if you look at the science paper that I gave you the reference to, that discusses the, the protein. I mean, often the proteins are quite similar between the mouse and humans. But of course, uh, there are cases known where, where the mouse is totally different from humans. So that is a complication that we sometimes have. But this is more for human diseases than for for parasites, it's usually um, uh, no, not such a, a big problem. Uh, we usually work on 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 proteins. Um, I mean, when we work on proteins, like for SARS-CoV-2, we work on on a protease, and these proteins, of course, we can isolate and 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 we we only want to inhibit these proteins uh, so that the virus is killed, and so that's much more easy than if you work on a human disease or on a, on a, on a disease where the mouse might, might have a different uh, target for infectious diseases, this is not a problem. Okay, then we go. Yeah, the exosomes. Um, <clears throat> I mean, exosomes are a little bit something that is thought that that is being talked a lot about a lot in drug discovery, but currently um, it doesn't really play a big role in the drug discovery for small molecular compounds. It may be be impactful in the future, but um, uh, you know, drug. I mean. If you want to use drug delivery vehicles, um, uh, that of course first needs to be approved 
uh, by the authorities, right? Currently, um, you know, nanotechnology is talking a lot about drug discovery, uh, drug delivery vehicles, but as long as they are not approved by the authorities, we cannot really use them to deliver um, a compound. So that's the limitation for these type of, of uh, delivery vehicles. If they're approved, then of course, that will change the whole thing. Um, I, it may, you know, if you have good drug delivery, it may reduce the chemistry. But obviously um, that needs to be seen, right? Because also, also when, you, when you deliver your drugs uh, in my cells or whatever you want to call it, exosomes, uh, you will, you will of course have to make sure that these type of uh, delivery vehicles do not have toxicity. And that's often a little bit of problem for that. So we'll see how that, how that goes into the future. But currently, I don't know of any drugs that, that is delivered by, by exosomes. Um, but obviously a lot of people are talking about it. Usually drug, um, because we are, we're so um, focused on safety, these type of new inventions, it takes quite a long time until the safety has been established so that, um, that um, uh, they can be used in, in drug delivery. I mean, for example, if you could deliver uh, RNA, this would be a huge breakthrough, right? Or DNA. But the, the limitation of these type of nucleic acid drugs is still drug delivery. And even a lot of people work on that. The problem still has not been solved. And that's why only, I think, one, one or two uh, RNA-based drugs are currently on the market. Then, oh, did, uh, I don't know whether these are the papers that I that are referenced. Uh, maybe that's that's refers to me. What is the mechanism that makes the difluoroversion of the compound better than the fluorochlor version? Um, I mean, I, I hope I demonstrated that in terms of pharmacokinetics, um, the two compounds, the fluorochloro is a little bit better than the, than the difluoro. In terms of the potency, they're actually quite the same. So the difluoro is not really superior um, we also have to keep the error of these of this assays in mind. So they behave very similarly in the in the um, on the protein targets that we know now. Uh, but in terms of pharmacokinetics, I think the chlorofluoro is a bit better because it's a little bit more hydrophobic, and therefore it stays a bit longer in the in the circulation. Then we have this in drug development. If drug development takes years, how then are countries claiming that they can find vaccine drugs for COVID-19 so soon? I mean, what people have tried to do is um, uh, find, we do what is called repurposing of, of existing drugs, right? That is much, much quicker. For example, we know that dexamethasone, this is a steroid that, that that has been that is on the market for a lot of different diseases, that this has proven to be useful for treating very sick SARS-CoV-2 patients. Um, and that has been a big breakthrough, but this is an existing drug, so it obviously didn't have to be optimized in, in the way I described. I mean, all the, the press releases that you've heard about AI and people finding drugs, that is just kind of making noise. None of these compounds has been used in patients or has been optimized. So, so there has been a lot of publicity, but um, uh, people have talked about, I mean, for example, people were talking about chloroquine, right? Or hydroxychloroquine, especially Donald Trump was, was kind of adver advertising that as a very good treatment. But when you look at the clinical trials, hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine do not um, have an important impact on, on the disease, that on COVID-19. And so you always have to be careful 
uh, between um, publicity that Biotechs puts out and the actual science, right? So as far as we know now, I mean, vaccines are different. I'm not really a vaccine expert. Um, I think vaccine, there have been huge, huge breakthroughs in, in, in terms of using RNA and DNA to vaccinate people. And of course, that's what Moderna is doing. Uh, this is the first time that this technology is being tried in sars cov 2 And of course, the compound, the vaccine is not on the market, right? So we'll see whether this is going to be a safe vaccine. It's not in phase three studies. And, and, and I think for vaccines, there have been huge breakthroughs. But for drugs, there hasn't really been, I, I'm not aware. I mean, there's lots of publications, but most of the compounds that are being published about are still years away from, you, from being used in patients. Yeah, then we have what led to the idea to include chloro and fluoro group, why not methyl group or the meth uh, chemical groups, right? That's, that's um, if you're a methyl chemist and you've gone through the training, then you would know that a methyl group can be very quickly metabolized as well, while fluoro and chloro group are resistant to, to metabolism. And so fluoro and chloro groups are traditionally used by methyl chemists to block metabolism. So that's something that, that, that methyl chemists, uh, you know, it's know-how that methyl chemists have. And, and so um, methyl group would not have been, you know, if somebody would have asked me, should I use a methyl group? I would have said, no, this would be metabolized as well. Use a fluoro, a chloro. Um, I mean, maybe you could use a cyanide or something like that, right? So a nitrile group. Uh, to block and see, but, but maybe that would have induced, induced some, some um, um, toxicity. I mean, you always have to try out, right? But the obvious thing to try on this was fluoro and chloro groups. During the discovery process, you take cytochrome B15 emission in con as a consideration. Do you also test the compounds in human cells and observe the toxicity. The drug should target specifically plasmodium falciparum with very new side effects to human cells, in my opinion. Yes, that's totally, absolutely true. Actually, I took out the slide which discussed our testing of compounds in human, uh, um, in human cells to test for toxicity and, and our compounds were totally clean, but it was a little bit uh, um, a slide that was difficult to explain, so I took it out. But we need a lot of toxicity, toxicity testing. If the compound was shown toxicity in the in human cells, the compounds would never have made it um, further. Yes, of course, um, that was very important. What is my opinion regarding host directed therapy? Would it not be more advantageous in terms of, of more chances of translation to host? Um, I mean, that's, that's a very important question. And um, traditionally, when we look, for example, at, at, at hepatitis C or, hep or HIV protease, it has proven to be less uh, problematic to target the virus than the host. Uh, when you target the host, then you always have to be very careful that you don't interfere with mechanisms that are very important for the host. And so the first um, reflex is usually for medical chemists to work on the virus. And I think also virologists, they, they much prefer to work on the virus than to work on the host protein. But of course, it's clear that, that, um, that there are tons of host targets that you could target, but um, experience shows that, that some of these, I mean, for example, interferon, which, which obviously is, um, is, is targeting the interferon receptor, was used for hepatitis C for a long time, but the interferon had, a, had big side effects, and so the patients didn't like it. And, the, and currently, most HCV drugs are, are targeted at the virus. So, and in malaria, actually, I don't know of any 
host targeted um, drugs. Um, so traditionally, people have preferred to target the parasite or the virus rather than the host. But uh, it, it doesn't mean that that host targets are not very attractive. Yeah, I mean, HERC, that's, that's always a problem for when you work on, especially in cancer, um, because HERC is, at, at these, are, these are ion channels in the heart and exactly the, the Q, QC prolongation, right? That's a big problem. And so we test every drug that every compound, not every compound, but always when a compound advances a little bit further, we'll, we'll test it in the, in the herb channel and see whether the compound inhibits this herb channel. I mean, of course, there are quite a lot of traditional drugs which you probably may have used in the past, um, which which uh, have HERC modulation, right? I mean, they don't always um, uh, lead to bad outcomes. But of course, the problem with with inhibiting HERC is that one of the side effects is acute death, right? If somebody is really, really uh, susceptible to HERC inhibition, uh, the heart can just stop. And of course, that is not something that you really want in a drug. So we always try to reduce the, the HERC activity as much as we can. And these days, I think it's very hard to bring a drug to the market that has a HERC activity. It's a, it's a headache, there's no question, even, even for methyl chemists like myself. It's actually very difficult to remove a HERG activity from a compound uh, if you have it. It's actually much easier to just go to another compound, to a totally different scaffold. And we have in animal assays, how did you determine the stability of the compound, the time they stayed in vivo and its metabolized product in vivo? Uh, did you apply fluorescence imaging or other detection methods? I think for this one, um, we usually use mass spec. We don't really use fluorescence imaging. What we do is um, we inject the compound into the mouse and um, we then um, look at how the compound is eliminated. That this is done or, this, or this, uh, are distributed in the, in the blood of the mouse. Uh, so, for example, if you want to go for all bioavailability, you give the compounds only to the, to the mouse, and then you look for the compound in the blood or in the plasma by mass spec. I mean, this is this is the way. Um, this is the best direct way, right? We these days we really want to want to have um, as little label as possible. We want to want to really have the direct readout of the compound. And that's why mass spec is so important in drug discovery these days. Fluorescence imaging, you always have to have to uh, uh, use fluorescent fluorescent tags, or you have to or you have to inject uh, fluorescent um, imaging um, agents and things like that. And that always is a little bit more complicated than just looking by mass spec for the compound. Yeah, I mean, blood-brain barrier is a big is a is a big issue, right? Uh, depending on the properties of the compound, the compound will either go through blood-brain barrier or not. And so, with more smaller compounds, I mean, we often try that compounds do not go into the brain if it can, if it's if it's um, for, for example, for peripheral cancer, for for lung cancer, or for for colon cancer. We don't really like to have it, the compound go into the, into the brain. But of course, if you have uh, brain cancer, then of course you need to design special compounds that go into the brain. That's sometimes very difficult. Uh, I mean, I'm not, I've never worked um, in the CNS uh, on uh, drugs for the brain, so I'm not an expert on that. No, I, I didn't talk about these 12, um, these 12,000 compounds. Uh, these are, it's a collection of natural products that, um, 
that Novartis has. And these do not contain already existing drugs. These are compounds that have been isolated from all over the world from natural products and from natural, from plants. And Novartis has collected them. And so uh, these are totally new compounds um, that otherwise, you know, screening for them, if it's already a known compound, would not be that useful. So this is a special collection from the Marquis. In the slide, it was mentioned that fluorine atoms are quite small. Excuse me for a second. And hence they use to block metabolism. They are inert and small with therefore do not affect SAR. But it's a fluorine, yeah, this is, this is, I agree, I agree. It's, it's a, fluorine is actually, is very electronegative. Yes, it will influence a little bit the properties um, of the compound. But uh, traditionally, it has been taken as a hydrogen replacement. But of course, if you look more carefully, then the electronegativity can influence the compound. But with metabolism, this is really not a whole, uh, the electronegativity doesn't really play that much a role. Um, it more because what happens in, in metabolism, the compound goes into the P450 enzymes and the metabolism is, 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 um, is happening at the iron of the, of the heme in the, inside the P450. And so um, it will be specifically done at certain position of the of the, um, of the molecule. And so the electronegativity is not that important. It certainly affects the properties. And you can see that actually, when we included the, the fluorine atom, I didn't talk about this, the, the potency of the compound actually increased. This was, this was fortuitous, but of course it affected the structural activity. There's no, yeah, no question. It could also have been negative, of course, but but it's still often used to block metabolism and often actually doesn't influence the properties of the compound that much. Yeah, the gram negative, uh, that's the big problem, right? Do you know anybody who works on drug discovery for gram negative uh, bacteria, bacterial diseases? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big problem because these are the the bacteria that we have problems in the hospitals with. We still have quite a few drugs available for, for some of them, but I agree drug discovery for gram-negative bacteria is really, really important. And um, we have done some work at ETC on that, but um, uh, there's not that much support from, from a star for, to work on negative bacteria. It's a very complicated and very, very difficult uh, topic. Uh, and of course it's needed, but um, it's not one of the priority areas um, for funding in Singapore. Then we have to, for diseases that are virus related, the virus may have a high mutation rate. And in that case, the drug that works on a previous strand may not work on the next. So what would be your opinion on whether it will be good investment secure? Um, I mean, this is, um, I mean, you're right that, that the virus mutates its RNA a lot, but this actually does not impact the, the proteins of the, the virus needs for application a lot. So um, it's not such a big problem. I mean, that, that has actually, if you read some papers on SARS-CoV-2, these discussions of mutations in the virus, uh, they often do not have a big impact on, 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 the, on the virus itself, you know, whether it's more, whether it's more serious or not. And actually, for example, in dengue, when we work in dengue, um, while well, the dengue virus mutates a lot, but it doesn't really change uh, the structure of its uh, of the very important proteins a lot. And so that's not really, if you work in the active side of a protein, the mutation of the RNA is not really one of the, uh, a big problem for drug discovery.
Um, that depends what you uh, testing a drug for human cell disease is of course important, but are you also looking at effects on gene expression programs? If so, how? I mean, for malaria, this was not done. For infectious diseases, that is not really important because uh, uh, it, uh, uh, because we're trying to kill a virus or a malaria, and hopefully your drug will not influence the gene expression of human proteins. That would be a problem, right? Um, if you work in cancer, of course, you will look at gene expression. Um, and of course, that will be very important, uh, for example, in choosing patients for clinical trials and things like that, or for infectious diseases. I, it's not that important, I mean, except if you work on hepatitis C or dengue, and if there's, uh, there's, if there's different um, uh, serotypes or, um, or different types of the virus, then of course you're gonna, you're gonna see what your drug is, is, is uh, active on, on, on serotype three versus serotype two and things like that. But, but in terms of gene expression, as we understand it, human gene expression, this is not that important in infectious diseases. Is important in cancer. Yeah, so uh, this is about toxicity. Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm not such a, you know, since I'm a chemist, I'm not such an expert in compound toxicity. And, and, you know, there's a lot of interesting uh, things available at ASTAR uh, in terms of testing toxicity. But um, this is not really something that, that we have been using. And maybe, maybe that's, that's a mistake. But, but since I um, uh, kind of uh, play a role in the medical chemistry, um, we are, of course, using toxicity assays at, um, a lot. But um, you may be um, talking more about liver toxicity, and of course that is um, that's a, that only comes later. I mean, we are looking at, at liver microsomes, uh, we're looking at cytochrome P450 inhibition and things like that. And only if we have a problem, then we start looking at more sophisticated assays. Yes, I mean, obviously, a uh, thermal shift assay, that's, that's really sets up, for example, that's really, really important. Um, and of course, but that's less for, that's less for toxicity, that's more for, for the interaction of the compound with a, with a, with a target. And that's basically target engagement, right? That's, that's really important these days. Um, and of course, sets are in the beginning, was a little bit um, um, in the first science paper. Uh, it was very interesting, but in the last few years, it's been developed a lot. I think currently it's really, really useful. I mean, target engagement, if you are talking about chemical biology, really, really important. Then we have after chloro and fluoro compounds being tested, can the other analogs be targets or evaluated. Um, in principle, IOTO compounds, we don't really like to put them into the into compounds because <clears throat> they're chemically not that stable and um, they're huge, right? They're big, big, um, big hydrophobic lumps. And so that's why fluoro and chloro is often used in, um, in metal chemistry, but bromo and IOTO is really we only using, for example, if we make a contrast, uh, a contrast agent, you know, which, which is then used for imaging or something like that. Um, but it's not, it's too hydrophobic to really be used um, often in metal chemistry. Yes, I, I'm, Drug-target interactions. I mean, we have a lot. You know, there's lots of of um, um, technologies out there, um, and and we are kind of, of course, have to use 
valid if it wants. But you know, if you're if you want to contact me, please send me an email. Then I can put you in contact with uh, with uh, with the people that that are uh, important in this area. Okay, I think we have we have everything, and it's actually time for lunch now. Thank you, Dr. Keller, for answering all these interesting questions from our audiences, and especially thanking your time. Uh, thank you for taking taking your time off uh, amid your busy schedule to join this webinar. And thank you all for being such a wonderful audience for this event. And before you leave this webinar, uh, do scan the QR code for the survey form, which will be flashed on your screen. We value your feedback to help us improve for our future webinars. Till then, stay healthy. Okay, thank you everybody. I will...